The crisis in Syria took a very, very sad turn. It's almost two years uh, since it started. What uh, concerns us most uh, about this crisis is the price that the Syrian people are paying, whether those who are being killed or those who are being kidnapped or those who are being maimed or those who have been made into displaced and refugees. And unfortunately, being a, a political person and watching all what the world says about Syria, I see and hear very, very few voices that really have give any thought about the Syrian people. It is not true that it is a Sunni against Shia. It's not true. They are killing as many Sunnis as they are killing Shia, as many Christians as they are killing Muslims, as many whatever religions, whatever ethnicity, it doesn't matter. And the kidnapping and the, butch the butchering of people is something that Syria has never ever witnessed in its history. We are sure that this does not come from Syrian people. It comes from a much larger and much further people who really want the destruction of Syria as we know it. If you ask me as a member of government, what are you fighting for and why are you there? I would tell you I'm fighting for the identity of my country. I want my country to remain a secular, tolerant, in which all religions and all ethnicities lived for thousands of years. There, were, there was no homeless person in Syria before the crisis. While now, unfortunately, we're speaking of the homeless, of the displaced, of the <coughs> refugees, of all, of all this. Of course, there is another dimension to the crisis, not only the domestic crisis. There is the regional and there is the international dimension to this crisis. I think most Syrians would agree with me that we feel now that Qatar and Turkey are the spearhead of a war against our country. And I can't go into the details, but I think the government of Turkey wanted Muslim brothers to govern in Syria and wanted Muslim brothers to take the political lead in Syria. All what you hear about the Russians taking the veto, uh, you know, in, in the Security Council, thank God, there is Russia and China and India and Brazil and the BRICS countries who at least are introducing reason into what is happening in the international community. Libya, Yemen, Tunisia, Egypt, Iraq, Sudan, you would know that the design for this region is a very evil design. It is to divide the region into ethnicities, into different religious states, into very small states, so that a Jewish state would look normal and would be su superior to all these states after looting their history and after killing their leaders and destroying their professionals. What we want India to do, what we want the world to do, is to help in putting an end to this war that is raging in Syria, to this violence today. The solution was designed in June 2012 in Geneva, in the Geneva Accord. And we immediately agreed to that. But those who are called the opposition refuse the Geneva Accord. And even those who signed the Geneva Accord, I remember I, we, we heard the news about the agreement and Sergei Lavrov came out and spoke about the agreement. And 15 minutes afterwards, Hillary Clinton came on television and said, President Assad has to resign. Although that was not in Geneva Accord. So she came to contradict what she agreed on in the closed room less than 10 minutes after the agreement was reached. On the land in Syria, there are more than 148 
military groups fighting. None of them has anything to do with the other. And this is not my statistics, this is statistic of Brahimi, Akhdar, Lakhdar Brahimi office in Damascus. For very different reasons. Some of them, they kidnap people just to get ransom, to get money. Some of them are Qaeda, some of them are jihadists, some of them believe that when they butcher people, they go to heaven and have lunch with the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Some of them are sent by different countries for very evil reasons. Some of them mushroomed during the war, discovered that they can make money and they can take power during the war and became warlords and started to have people and fighters and armaments with them. So what does this all tell us? is that war means chaos. And those who are preventing a peaceful solution to the crisis in Syria are those who want chaos to prevail in Syria. The Syrian people are asking for arms to fight terrorism and to fight fundamentalism. Because like India, we are a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious society. And this is the only identity we want. We are a secular society. The Syrian people will never accept to hand their country to fundamentalists and to Wahhabi uh, extremists. So we are sure of our people, we are sure of our army, we are sure of what we are doing, but we want violence to stop because we do not want one more Syrian people to be killed. And that's why we would love India, Brazil, Russia, China, and South Africa to make a very strong decision in the forthcoming meeting of the BRICS in support of a political solution in Syria, in support of the Geneva Agreement, in support of political dialogue, and in support of the Syrian people and their right to decide their future for themselves. I, let me first um, tell you that you used you yourself, use the international community Imports. the way the West uses it. Yeah. Because if you take Russia and India and China and Brazil and South Africa, well, these are a big part of the international community. So the, what you mean by the international community is Western countries, yes, the United yeah. States and Europe. Yes. These are the ones really who are targeting Syria. And I invite all of you to stop using international community to mean the West. The international community is the international community. It's not the West. So use Western forces, please, but not the international community. Okay. I do agree with you. Yeah. I do agree with your analysis that either they make a system fall or they might let it go for decades. And that's why I'm saying it's very urgent we stop violence now because I don't disagree with you. They might, part of the plan, might very well be that let the Syrians fight for a decade and let Syria be destroyed. And, and they are not losing one dollar or one soldier. It's all our people, it's our land, it's our institutions. We realize that and we are worried about that. And that's why we feel that we want to stop violence now, whether President uh, Assad, uh, you know, uh, the, the issue of President Assad, the issue of the, of the system is not the issue at all. So I am not, you know, 100% confident, but I am saying that for two years, Russia and China and India and, and you know, the BRICS countries have been taking a very honest and very balanced stand. I, I have also no reason to believe that they will change this stand. I think they will go on because also the more they know about the fact, the more they are confident that this is a design against Syria and against the Syrian people. Now, how it's going to end, I don't know. You know, what is going to happen to Syria, I don't know. Of course, as a Syrian, every morning I'm hopeful that violence will stop today. And all what we can do is to work hard to approach these countries, to con try to convince them that they should work with us for putting an end to violence. And you, as media people, play a very important role in you know, highlighting the true issues, not what 
of course, because part of the war is the media war against Syria. And all the Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya and all the fabrication that they have been, you know, uh, doing since the beginning of the crisis. So uh, I'm hopeful, you can't say. But, you know, I, I have faith in God that to help us and with all of you, with everybody who cares about what <coughs> human lives, to help us in stopping this crazy war in Syria. I think it's very difficult to counter Western narrative simply because they have the media all at their disposal, you know. And even the two satellites that we have, they downed them from the satellites. So Syria has no satellite now. But I, w I would answer you, you know, and you, you see how to handle that. There is no country in the world that would like its army to be spread in its cities. And there's no history at all, at any moment, that the Syrian army was in our cities or in our villages. But I will ask you, what do you do when criminals are kidnapping your people, uh, butchering them, threatening their safety, burning their school, burning their houses? You have to defend your own people. And therefore, even the martyrs from the army who are killed, they are killed because of the terrorists. Even all the violence that is happening in Syria, the responsibility of this violence is on the hands of those who, are, who started the violence and who are trying to make Syria a very chaotic and very troublesome place. We, the, the army, the Syrian government, they are not there against their citizens. They are there to protect their citizens. And I came from the city of Homs, and all my brothers and sisters are still living there. And I know what it means. You know, the, the army didn't go anywhere except after the citizens of that city <coughs> begged the government, please send us an army because those are kidnapping our women, raping our women, killing us, destroying our schools, destroying our cities. <coughs> the government has the obligation to protect its citizens. But as the fabrication they do, what, what can you do? You know, and it's very, very difficult to counter that logic. I met the foreign minister and the, the, the state minister for foreign affairs and the national security advisor. Uh, actually, I, uh, I received all welcome and understanding of this logic. And uh, the Indian government is also very keen for violence to stop. And as they are chairing now the BRICS countries, and they are going to be in South Africa late this month, uh, I felt that they totally understand and support uh, the two <coughs> main factors that are of extreme concern to me. Stopping the violence today before tomorrow, and the decision should be that of the Syrian people. Al-Qaeda, not I think, I see. Every day you see the flags of Al-Qaeda, you see the people of Al-Qaeda in the black, butchering people and saying Allahu Akbar or La ilaha illallah. You just see them, you know, you know, they, it is absolutely, uh, they, even the Ibrahimi people will not be able to move because they were warned that if they move, Al-Qaeda would, would uh, target them. So there is definitely a huge presence of Al-Qaeda and the more dangerous than that is that Al-Qaeda is even financing other uh, uh, armed gangs. You know, they tell them go and, and uh, do uh, an explosion or a car bomb. We pay you the money and put it in our name. So they are, they are, they are playing a very, very vicious and very evil role in Syria. I would say they are the major factor in Syria. There's a proverb in the Arab world that used to say, uh, <coughs> Lebanon, uh, Egypt writes, Lebanon publishes, and Iraq reads. Uh, it's a well-known fact that the Iraqis are the most educated. The Iraq is a rich country, but with rich manpower, not like any Gulf country with, with no manpower. So if you think Iraq, Sudan, Syria, Algeria, you're right. They were all targeted, and they were all secular, progressive, 
regimes uh, where women uh, played a role uh, while, while with Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, we all know what the situation is. And of course, uh, I think you and I agree that, you know, what the West cares about is the oil and the gas, uh, you know, the gas pipeline that has to go now from Qatar through Syria to the Mediterranean. Even the line of events and the clashes in Syria followed that line, you know, from Aleppo to, <coughs> to Ma'arrat al-Nu'man to Homs to, uh, to the Mediterranean. Uh, of course, in Libya, who cares about the Libyan people? They, they care about the gas and about the oil in Libya. Unfortunately, as an Arab woman, I feel that we have not really gotten our real independence, really. Because the most important thing in independence is the independence of will. And uh, I w I've been to Arab summits in Libya in 2010, and I know how you know, Arab people were uh, directing issues. They don't, have, they don't have independence of will. And I think this is a major factor why Syria is targeted. Because you know, when President Bashar al-Assad came to power, they hailed him as Western educated, which means their agent. You know, they think if we study in the West, we have to become their agents. You know, they can't stand anybody who's truly independent. But when when the war on Iraq happened in 2003, Syria was against the war on Iraq, and President Assad took a very strong position against the war. In 2006, he took a very strong position against Israel and in support of Hezbollah against the war on Lebanon. In 2008, he took a very strong position in support of the Palestinian people. And, the, and all the ships were coming through the Mediterranean and through, through Syria. So, so they discovered that this is not their guy. You know, This is not the man that, that will, will follow orders. And therefore, they want to destroy this example and put anybody that will serve their interest. I agree with you that the biggest dilemma is, is the Gulf state versus the Arab countries. And unfortunately now, not only Saudi Arabia, Qatar is leading, <laughs> is leading the Arab action in the, in the Arab League, which is, uh, you know, is ridiculous. But I think it's a historical epoch that will pass and, and, and things will, will, will settle in their proper place. Well, uh, President Assad's plan is to save the country from this raging war and to stop this violence and to reach peace and to conduct dialogue. Don't you ever think that there's something that President Assad would agree to with the West and then the West is going to say, yes, Syria should be a very good country and we should help Syria. I think, I, you know, I think we have to be very clear. <clears throat> Those who started this war against Syria want the destruction of Syria. What we and the BRICS countries want is to save Syria and to save the Syrian people. That's I said to the ministers I met and to the officials and to the people I met that we would like you to be more vocal, to come out more strongly in support of stopping violence. I think the BRICS countries carry more weight than they are showing so far in the, in, on the international scene. And I think they can do more. We are grateful for their balance and stand and for their support, but I think they could be more proactive in finding a solution for Syria. We are ready to talk to anybody. We are ready to talk to the West, but you need them to be ready to talk to us. We, we personally in Syria believe that what Turkey is doing is very bad for Turkey in the medium run, not in the long run, in the medium range. What Qatar is doing is very bad for Qatar. The West is short-sighted, you know. They have proven that they are short-sighted. I mean, when they came to Iraq, you know, they came, they first started the Iraq-Iran war because with the double containment. But then if you look at it, as you said, hard-headedly, you will see now that Iran has become a major power in the region, whether they like it or not. But partly because of their actions, partly because of their, of their policies towards Iraq and towards Arab countries. I think, they be, I think they do not see, they speak about international community, but they really do not believe in international community. They believe that the West could be insulated from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, from the Arab world, 
And I, I think they will discover, probably a bit too late, that it cannot be insulated. And that terrorism that is fighting in Syria could be in the south of France, could be in London, could be in the United States, could be in India, could be anywhere, because it doesn't, it doesn't acknowledge borders. It works across borders. We, I once said that I would love when President Bush was uh, you know, uh, planning to invade uh, Iraq and we were at the Security Council, we were presiding over the Security Council, I said to Kundalita Rice, we are ready to w c give him advice for free. We don't want any money, but, but uh, those advisors of him who are getting a lot of money are really taking the United States the wrong track. But you know, they don't listen. They are arrogant because they are colonial. They believe, they, they understand better and they, they are smarter and they have many think tanks who are called experts if they visit the region for five days, you know. So <laughs> what, what can you do with them? You know, our army is, is there and it's fighting and I think uh, you have to see it this way. Because they have been promising the world that they will take Damascus and they will take Aleppo. And they were not able to take anything in Damascus or Aleppo. They went to a very small and easy target and made a media show rather than a very real show on the ground. That's what they do really. But we are very strong on the ground. Our army is there, our people are there, so don't worry about it really. But it is a, an answer to the media for their failure in Aleppo and in Damascus, which they uh, consider very important. As for the sectarian issue, I agree with you. I mean, the Prime Minister of Syria was a Christian, although the Christians are only 10 percent, you know, Fars al Khuri. Uh, and uh, we do not have this mentality in Syria. Those of you who visited Syria would know that we do not have this mentality in Syria. And although President Assad is an uh, Alawite, his prime minister is a Sunni, his foreign minister, his defense minister, you know, are all Sunnis, you know, and, but we do not, we, in fact, I feel very embarrassed to pronounce the word because this is not the language we speak in Syria. We are all Syrian. I am a Muslim, but honestly, I prayed at least 10 times in Sednaya Church and in Ma'lula Church because uh, it's all the house of God and we, we all are brought up together. All Muslims put a Christmas tree in their homes. Many Christians fast with us in Ramadan. This is the, the beautiful identity of Syria. The, I don't think uh, Turkey can play any role in, in, in Syria, except the very destructive role it's playing. It's looting Syria, actually, besides supporting Wahhabi, anybody in Turkey, any journalist would tell you that the camps of Jubhat al-Nasra are all in Turkey, and they are coming through Turkey to Syria. Now, if Turkey, if the, if the world community was able to close the Turkish border from Syria for a week, the Syrian crisis would be over. So, you know, it's, it's a very destructive role that they are taking, but I believe, and you remember me, Turkey is going to suffer more than Syria. The evil it's creating and sending to Syria is going to uh, go back to Turkey. And you can read the Turkish media and that what the Turkish people are saying, are saying the same thing. Yesterday, President Assad received a Turkish delegation from the opposition. We differentiate between the Turkish government and the <coughs> Turkish people. And what the Turkish government is doing is not supported by the entire Turkish people. The Turkish people are our friends and Turkey is our neighbor. But what the Turkish government is doing is very evil towards Syria and very bad for Turkey in the future. The Arab League ended the mission of General Dabi and moved the Syrian portfolio to the Security Council. And when Kofi Annan came, he has his six-point plan. Number one in his plan is to stop violence by all parties. And of course, he was speaking about the need to stop armament, to stop sending mercenaries, but nobody would listen to him. So yes, I agree with you. It is the Western countries who did not listen to, and who did not respond to the first point plan because in order to solve the crisis in Syria or in order to conduct the election or in order to do anything, first you have to stop violence. First you have to stop the war that, that is raging. And so uh, unfortunately Kofi Annan didn't say what happened to him until he left his mission when he was signing his book a few weeks ago. He said Western country refused to stop armaments 
and refused to stop supporting the rebels. He should have said that when he was on his mission. You know, they only they keep the truth for their memoirs. You know, they don't uh, they don't act uh, on the truth, but they, they keep it for their memoir. And and now Akhtar Ibrahimi is uh, is there, and he is trying. But I think the the uh, the the obstacle and the stumbling block, if you want, that is facing all of them, is that there are Western countries who are partners into what is happening in Syria and who refuse to stop the armament and the finance. A lot of money is being paid uh, to these people. And so that's why Sergei Lavrov says there should be a will of the international community. Because once there is a will on the Western side, then the BRICS and the Western side will be able to have a joint will of stopping violence in Syria. The British government, that what they are sending is very lethal to the Syrian people. And they can't say non-lethal. This is not accurate phrase at all. If you consider the planes who struck the Twin Towers in 9-11, are they lethal or non-lethal? They're civilian planes, but they killed thousands of people, right? So what is being sent? These are not armed rebels. These are fundamentalist Wahhabi groups who are trying to bring darkness to Syria, who are trying to take Syria to dark ages. And I really find it surprising that Western governments would support such groups against a secular system that has a lot more in common with the West, at least you know, as we, as we know it, uh, rather than uh, support this system. So I, I, we are very sorry that this is what France and Britain and other Western countries are doing. But as I said earlier, if you were here, the support the British government is giving to these fundamentalists is going to go back to Europe one day. We all have to join each other in fighting terrorism. And we shouldn't think that terrorism in Syria is very far off from anywhere in the world because it, it crosses borders. So we, we, we hope that these governments would change their mind, would know. What does William Hill know about what's happening in Syria? As a Syrian woman, I tell him, every penny he is sending, everything he is sending is causing the killing and the death and the rape of Syrian people. Thank you.